A mysterious woman lures a businessman across state lines with the promise of a lucrative deal. When he vanishes, authorities turn to the FBI for help. Suspicions point to a bitter business rival, but the suspect stonewalls investigators. Agents would use state-of-the-art technology to find friends and lovers who might be willing to reveal the truth. A wealthy businessman went to Florida to make one last deal before he retired, but he never returned home to his millions. Authorities examined who was closest to the victim and who stood to gain from his disappearance. But this time, conventional rules did not apply. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. In a case that spanned the entire East Coast, agents would have to untangle a web of sex, money, and vengeance that led to murder. Newark International Airport in New Jersey. On Saturday, February 24, 1996, Kiwi Airlines Flight 45 took off for West Palm Beach, Florida. 58-year-old Frank Black was on board. Black owned and operated a successful school bus and transportation company in Andover, New Jersey. Thank you. He had made millions and was on his way to Florida to meet a new industry contact. Black told his family and co-workers he would be home Monday in time for another meeting. He also told them that his contact in Florida, a woman named Mia Giordano, was to pick him up at the airport. She would take him to meet others involved in the lucrative business deal. Privately, Black hoped to retire after closing the deal. When Black failed to return on Monday, his family contacted the New Jersey State Police. Detective Sergeant Lee Liddy was one of the state detectives assigned the missing persons case. He was the kind of guy that he would always phone home. He always wanted to know what was going on with his business. He was a hands-on type of guy. Without Frank, the business really didn't run. And that's why they were concerned when they didn't hear from him. All of a sudden, he disappeared because Frank wasn't the kind of guy who would just walk away from his business. New Jersey investigators interviewed Black's daughter, Leanna, and his girlfriend and office manager, Sally Roberts. Leanna said her father had missed an important meeting with her to discuss the sale of his business. He also had not answered calls to his cell phone. Sally Roberts recalled that the woman from Florida, Mia Giordano, had phoned the office many times recently but never left her number. The Florida woman claimed to represent a company named Valdez Exporting. Giordano provided a description of herself so Black could recognize her at the airport. She said she was five foot one and blonde. A detective visited the travel agent who booked Black's trip. The agent confirmed that Black purchased a one-way ticket to Florida. He didn't bother to rent a car since his contact had arranged to pick him up. Airline records corroborated that Black had boarded the flight. But he had not registered at any hotels upon his arrival in West Palm Beach. An examination of Black's records revealed that his credit cards had been used after his arrival in Florida. To 
follow the credit card trail, New Jersey detectives contacted the Fort Pierce office of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. FDLE Special Agent Michael Driscoll was assigned the case. Frank Black's credit card was used at the Embassy Suites in Riviera Beach between approximately 1 in the morning and 2 in the morning. Okay, now we're talking about from February 24th into February 25th. And then at 4 o'clock in the morning, his credit card, a different credit card, but his, Frank Black's credit card was used to purchase gas at a gasoline station in North Miami. To investigators, this seemed odd since he hadn't rented a car. The state agent interviewed the employee who had worked on February 25th. When shown a photo of Black, the attendant said he didn't recognize him. The station's pumps all had credit card slots. No one would have had contact with Black or whoever was using his credit card. The employee didn't recall seeing anyone fitting Mia Giordano's description. Driscoll contacted the Florida Secretary of State Corporation Division to get an address for Valdez exporting, Mia Giordano's company. Okay, catch you later. Bye. He found no such company registered in the state. He also attempted to locate Mia Giordano herself. We did a very extensive search to identify any Mia Giordano in Florida, and we couldn't find any, I believe, any Mia Giordano's in Florida, or any that would even come remotely close. And we checked Florida as well as New Jersey and with negative results. On March 1st, a detective from the New Jersey State Police traveled to Florida where Frank Black's trail ended. Nobody had heard from Black in five days. Detectives now believe the millionaire had met with foul play. Their most likely suspect, a woman calling herself Mia Giordano, was untraceable. Investigators' focus turned to the phone calls Black received on the days leading up to his trip to Florida. We obtained the phone records of Frank Black, which identified phone calls from a residence in Jupiter and the residence in Jupiter was rented, it was a, a, a townhome rented by a girl identified as Lisa Costello. She wasn't blonde, but she was five foot one. Mia Giordano had described herself as being exactly that height. The calls from Lisa Costello matched the times when Mia Giordano allegedly phoned Black to set up the meeting in Florida. Mia Giordano was a fictitious figure. She never existed. And she was supposed to set up the deal with Frank Black. Mia Giordano was actually Lisa Costello. Investigators took Costello's photo to the hotel where Black's credit card had been used on February 25th. The resort was on the strip at Riviera Beach. The state agent asked to speak to the clerk who had been on duty the morning in question. While he waited, he checked the phone that had been used with Black's credit card. Like the gas pump, the phone required no signature from a customer, just a credit card. Anyone could have made the calls. Karen Voorhees had worked the front desk on the morning in question. but she did not recognize a photo of Frank Black. She did recall waiting on another customer that morning. At around 2 a.m., a, a dark-haired woman asked for a room. The hotel was booked, so she used a payphone several times to query other hotels. It was the same time Frank Black's credit card was used at the phone. Voorhees described the woman as being in her 30s with brown hair and standing a little over five feet tall. Driscoll showed Voorhees a photographic lineup of six women. Without hesitation, the clerk picked out Lisa Costello. 
Lisa Costello was now really the primary suspect. I mean, we did have some evidence on her that then uh, we checked the uh, car rental agencies by the West Palm Beach Airport and found out that Lisa Costello rented a car just shortly before the time that Frank Black's flight arrived. Investigators found the car at the airport rental lot. A subpoena allowed them to impound it for an evidence search by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. But examiners would find no trace of Frank Black in the car. There was no physical evidence linking Lisa Costello to the missing businessman. Florida investigators began covert surveillance on Lisa Costello. They followed the suspect for days to establish a routine and determine her contacts. They soon learned that Costello was dating a man named Alan Mackerley. Investigators began to tail Mackerley. Like Frank Black, he also owned a bus company in New Jersey, but was now living in Florida. The two men had known each other most of their lives. Over the years, Alan Mackerley and Frank Black built up a rivalry. The two bus companies are about 10 miles apart. So even though they each had their own contracts and their own business, they were always vying for the same contracts and the same business. Phone records indicated recent calls to Black from Mackerley's Florida home. This seemed strange since the two men were fierce rivals. Detectives went to speak with the manager of Black's bus company. Sally Roberts said Black and Mackerley used to be friends, but their business rivalry had made them enemies. She detailed the last time she had seen the men together. It was at an industry banquet in January of 1996. She and Frank were talking with friends when she saw Mackerley approaching. Angry that Black had stolen one of his major bus contracts, Mackerley threatened his rival. He said he was going to get him and put him under. That could mean put him out of business, and it could also possibly mean he was going to kill him someday. Black took the threat seriously. Afterwards, he wouldn't go to any meeting that Mackerley might attend, unless he had someone with him. Investigators contacted Mackerley to ask him if he had seen or spoken to Frank Black recently. Mackerley flatly denied calling him in the days preceding Black's trip to Florida. Him denying that and us knowing phone, rec phone calls have been made from his house to Frank Black's business obviously uh, indicated something uh, was wrong. Investigators believed that Mackerley and Costello had probably killed Frank Black. But they needed stronger proof. They turned to assistant state attorney Robert Belange. One of the first investigative tools that the FDLE wanted to use was wiretaps. So you have to show uh, a really compelling reason for listening to someone's telephone conversations. So we drafted those applications and orders and obtained uh, an order allowing us to listen to Alan Mackerley's telephone conversations. Unfortunately, investigators heard very few phone conversations between Mackerley and Costello. This was because Costello was now living with Mackerley. If they were talking about Black's disappearance, it wasn't over the phone. In order to record any incriminating conversations, investigators would have to bug Mackerley's house. 
Assistant State Attorney Lawrence Merman hoped they had enough probable cause to get inside. Being able to actually enter someone's home and plant a listening device is extremely restrictive and the, and the probable cause that's required is very high. Uh, the situations that would warrant that are very limited. This case actually presented that situation. A judge signed the warrant, and investigators planted listening devices in Mackerley's home. They set up outside, watching and listening. Got it. Hopefully, the couple would discuss what happened to Frank Black. Alan Mackerley and Lisa Costello were extremely cautious. Investigators believe the couple knew they were listening. And every time that we would uh, hear them starting to talk, the, they would turn the radio up in the kitchen loud. So we probably have several hundred hours of uh, tapes with nothing but put music on it. Once again, investigators came up empty-handed. Our chief assistant state attorney, Dave Morgan, had even commented to me after we failed to get anything on the wiretaps, it looks like Alan McAlee's gotten away with murder. Alan, what are you doing? With Black's body still Sorry, missing, McAlee and Costello could elude authorities as long as they maintained their silence. In June of 1996, Florida state agents believed that Alan McAlee and his girlfriend Lisa Costello had murdered 58-year-old millionaire Frank Black. But investigators had little evidence against the couple, and Black's body was still missing. They checked morgues in Palm Beach, Broward, and Dade counties where Black was last known to have traveled. There were no unidentified bodies matching Frank Black's description. If Mackerley and Costello had killed Black, they had covered their tracks well. Florida Department of Law Enforcement Special Agent Michael Driscoll expressed his frustration to his friend, FBI Special Agent Jay Miller. We used to play racquetball together, and he'd ask me about how this case was going, and I'd tell him, you know, a little bit about it, not, not a whole lot, and uh, he'd say, well, if you ever need a hand, and uh, I'd be happy to help out. In June of 1996, Special Agent Jay Miller asked to be assigned the case out of the FBI's Fort Pierce Resident Agency. And even though we were close friends, initially I did not know a lot of the details about uh, Frank Black's disappearance. But uh, as I could sense his frustration, I was able to elicit more information about the case. And uh, we were able then to come to an understanding that we needed to look at this thing again from the start. Though investigators believe McAlee killed Black over a disputed busing contract, wiretaps and listening devices had failed to tie him to any crime. Investigators' best lead was still Black's alleged meeting with Costello. Perhaps if subpoenaed and confronted with the evidence, she would turn on McAlee. It was a gamble that could jeopardize their entire case. By giving anyone, in this case Lisa Costello, a subpoena, it compels her to come in and give information, and it gives her immunity. Hypothetically, if she came in and admitted she killed Frank Black, she would be immune from that statement. You could not use that statement against her. On June 13, 1996, Lisa Costello appeared before a Florida grand jury. When questioned by state attorneys, she was uncooperative and hostile. The judge cautioned her that if she did not answer, she would be jailed for contempt.
Costello ignored his warnings. Investigators believed her refusal to cooperate confirmed she was involved in Black's disappearance. But it would take more than a hunch to solve the case. The gamble to subpoena Costello backfired. Now that Mackerley's closest ally was sitting behind bars, investigators had no potential witnesses to turn on the suspected murderer. Lacking further leads or physical evidence, the case against Mackerley might never make it to trial. Special Agent Michael Driscoll and his team were determined to keep this from happening. We heard information that, let's just say from a confidential source, that there was a witness who wanted to talk but was concerned about, one, that witness's own involvement, and two, Alan McAlee's violence. Felt that Alan McAlee was a violent person and that maybe there'd be retaliation if this unknown and unidentified witness would, would talk. That witness was Bill Anderson. A former Marine pilot, Anderson was one of Alan McAlee's closest friends. Agents interviewed him at his home in Florida, just down the street from Mackerley. Anderson had also owned a bus company in New Jersey and had been a commercial pilot after a decade of military service. So now we had two investigators, Driscoll and myself, and a prosecutor, Melange, all being Marines, and then the person who we believe could be the key to solving the case, Bill Anderson being a Marine. And so I think there was some camaraderie right there from the start. Investigators felt that bond would help them develop Anderson as a witness. He told the agents his friendship with McAlee had been strained recently, but he was reluctant to detail McAlee's relationship with Frank Black. The agents felt Anderson knew something that could break the case wide open. There was a little hesitancy on his part. We took it easy on him and uh, gave him a little space, gave him the opportunity to do whatever he needed to do, to confer with counsel or whatever. In our minds, we knew that we were talking to the man that had the answers, and he wasn't telling us. The agents met with Anderson on many occasions and slowly won his confidence. Thank you very much for your time. They knew he was loyal to his friend Alan McAlee, but they felt his sense of honor would eventually cause him to turn. Despite Anderson's lingering doubts, agents believed he was ready to talk by early August. They suspected a subpoena would help him justify turning against his friend. In my experience, good, honest, hardworking people that, that flew fighter jets in the Marine Corps would have a difficult time going under oath before the whole world and God and lying about it. Investigators had to take the chance. Like Costello, if Anderson had any part in the crime, his statements could not be used to prosecute him for murder. Five months after the disappearance of millionaire Frank Black, investigators had little evidence to support their theory that Black was murdered by his business rival, Alan McAlee. Looking for a fresh lead, investigators subpoenaed McAlee's close friend, Bill Anderson. Anderson had been reluctant to talk, but after a month, the former Marine's sense of honor prevailed. He began by telling investigators that Alan McAlee had purchased a plane earlier that year. McAlee asked Anderson to become his private pilot, since Anderson had experience flying fighter jets and commercial airliners. In exchange, Anderson could use McAlee's plane as he wished. In March of 1996, while staying at a hotel in Leesburg, Florida, to supervise repairs on the plane, Anderson was contacted by McAlee. His friend said he needed him to take the plane out over the ocean. Anderson explained that the aircraft would be grounded for several more days. 
He suggested they rent another plane. McAuley insisted on using his own plane. He didn't want anybody else to know about the flight. Anderson asked why. McAuley told Bill that he had shot Frank Black and that they had wrapped his body up in plastic, that they had taken the body out in the ocean and thrown it out in the ocean, and that the, the bag did not sink. And uh, he went on to tell Bill that it, it didn't sink, so he took a knife and stuck some holes in it, and uh, that the body did sink. McAuley told Anderson he was worried that the body had surfaced. He wanted to fly over the area to make sure it hadn't. Anderson refused. Anderson was shocked. I mean, I, I think he was truly shocked. Anderson, again, was in the bus business, as was McAuley and Black. And uh, Anderson and Black were not friends. Uh, Anderson did not like Black in the least either. But still, over a business rivalry, you don't kill somebody. According to Anderson, McAuley murdered Black in the foyer of his house. The former Marine pilot confirmed what investigators had suspected all along. It was the big break in the case. I mean, this was the moment we were all waiting for. And <clears throat> I remember explaining to him right away that Bill, we're gonna have to do a covert recording of you rehashing this conversation with Alan McAuley. Without a body or murder weapon, they would need McAuley's confession on tape. Anderson's testimony was good, but in court it would be his word against McAuley's. Anderson told prosecutor Robert Belanger that he was reluctant to wear a wire. He was afraid of McAuley because he admitted that he had just killed someone. And McAuley had also told him about a, a, an acquaintance up in New Jersey that got convicted of a crime because someone wore a wire. And he told Bill Anderson, if anyone ever wore a wire on me, I'd kill them. The investigators promised Anderson police protection. He agreed to wear the wire. The plan was to lure McAuley to Anderson's house. You'll be okay, so don't worry about it. Yeah, this is confident. This is well concealed. Right? Don't worry about it. FBI techs wired Anderson for sound and hid a video camera in the kitchen. When the equipment was in place, Anderson called McAuley. He told him he'd been served a subpoena and wanted to talk about what he should do. McAuley said he would be right over. In case something went wrong, Agent Driscoll would remain hidden in the house to protect Anderson. When the team outside saw McAuley approaching, they would radio Driscoll to hide. Yeah. Well, in a minute. While waiting, investigators spotted telephone repairmen. McAuley was paranoid about being bugged. If he saw the workers, he might think they were undercover agents. We knew that if he came to that house and saw these telephone company trucks, that it would have been all over as far as the investigation. McAuley would be there any minute. The investigators quickly ordered the repairman to leave. They then concealed the dig site. The investigators made it back to the car just before McAuley pulled up. The investigators tried to alert the men in the house, but they received no response. They radioed again, still nothing.
They had no way to know if Driscoll had received their call. He hadn't. The agent had seconds to hide. Anderson led Mackerley to the kitchen and sat down at the table as planned. He showed Mackerley the subpoena. Mackerley was hesitant to talk. I mean, he wouldn't talk loudly. He was pointing to the walls and saying, no, whispering like this, no, no, nobody knows. Whispering so that he couldn't be heard in Anderson's house. Not that he suspected Bill Anderson, but because he expected that the police were everywhere. They were. Detective Liddy and the others listened to McAuley and Anderson from the car. They had a discussion about what Bill Anderson was to testify to and whether or not Bill Anderson should lie for Alan McAuley. Bill Anderson even asked Alan McAuley that if he did uh, refuse to testify and was put in jail if Alan Mackerley would come forward and then tell the truth, and Alan Mackerley assured him that he would. Mackerley didn't want to continue talking in the house. He led Anderson Nobody outside. Told anyone else what you told me. No, this whole thing was supposed to take place at Bill Anderson's kitchen table and no place else. And so when he heard Alan Mackerley say, let's take a walk, uh, we were concerned that he was walking Bill Anderson out somewhere to eliminate him. He told anyone else what he told me. No, nobody. The property was if large lie, and covered with dense good. foliage. Will you come they could have walked anywhere. But McAuley unknowingly walked Anderson close to the surveillance team. My car is parked only a matter of probably uh, 80 or 100 feet from McAuley and Anderson, and we could hear distinctly on the transmitter their footsteps as they walked through the gravel and they walked closer to my vehicle with very little coverage concealing my, uh, my vehicle. The four of us sat there frozen in our car wondering, is this whole thing going to be blown because he's going to see us? Their case and their cooperating witness were in jeopardy. I'm sorry. If the investigators were discovered, they might not be able to protect Anderson from Mackerley's rage. Investigators in Florida watched as cooperating witness Bill Anderson met with murder suspect Alan Mackerley. Anderson was wearing a wire trying to get Mackerley to discuss the murder of Frank Black. New Jersey detective Lee Liddy feared what McAuley might do if he caught a glimpse of the nearby investigators. The two of them walked outside, which was very tense for all the investigators involved because at this point we have no control over what happens, where they go, or what they say. And because they were walking, and because of the pant leg of Bill Anderson rubbing and the movement of the clothes, it was very difficult to pick up conversation. So at that point, we really weren't sure what was happening. Before McAuley could spot the surveillance team, Anderson steered him away. Investigators now had incriminating statements on tape, but not a direct confession. They needed more. McAuley's alleged accomplice, Lisa Costello, remained in jail. She had been charged with contempt of court three months earlier for refusing to honor her subpoena. Agents would seek information from her friends to increase the pressure on the hostile witness. They interviewed Costello's former roommate. She said Costello used to deal cocaine and the sedative rufinol, which is odorless and tasteless. Depending on the dose, rufinol can relax a person or render them unconscious. FDLE Special Agent Michael Driscoll believed Costello sedated Frank Black with the drug. We suspected, matter of fact, from day one, that at some point Lisa and Frank Black 
may have gone to dinner or for drinks, and she was able to do that because he would not, he, Frank Black would not willingly or knowingly go into Alan McAuley's house. Hoping this information might pressure her into talking, a prosecutor met with Lisa Costello in jail. He told her that if she didn't cooperate, she would not have immunity. She could be charged with murder. Costello remained silent, despite the warnings of prosecutor Robert Belange. And Lisa Costello could have walked out of that jail cell any day simply by coming out and honoring that subpoena and telling us what she knew about the case. But she was a tough enough uh, witness that she sat in jail on a civil contempt. Despite Costello's silence, investigators pressed on. Assistant State Attorney Lawrence Merman felt they were ready to arrest. We had a, uh, an ear witness to a confession who was a very close friend of the defendant. We had a motive, we had circumstantial evidence. It was a very strong case. On August 29th, agents began aerial surveillance on Alan McAuley. A ground team assembled around the perimeter of the suspect's house. They made sure he was alone inside. That evening, the arrest team positioned themselves by his door. They would wait until he emerged to take him down in the open. When he stepped out with his dog, the team struck. The stunned suspect offered no resistance. Seven months after Frank Black vanished, Alan McAuley was arrested for kidnapping and murder. With no physical evidence, prosecutors prepared for a difficult trial. When McAuley's arrest hit the news, they received a call from a man with information on the case. The man agreed to give a statement. Robert Senadazian was Alan McAuley's son-in-law. He said that he'd received a call from McAuley on February 25th, the day after Black arrived in Florida. McAuley asked him to come over to help him clean his house. When Sanadazian arrived on Monday, February 26th, he saw that McAuley and Costello had already begun major renovations in the foyer. The carpet had been ripped up, and parts of the wall had been removed. Sanadazian told prosecutor Robert Belanger that McAuley explained why. Alan McAuley told Rob Sanadazian, Frank Black was at my home last Saturday, and even Sanadazian knew the relationship between Alan McAuley and Frank Black and expressed some surprise. Why would, why would Frank Black be at your home? And Alan clearly didn't want to talk about it. He just said, given the O.J. Simpson trial, DNA evidence, we got to make sure there's not even a hair of Frank Black's found in this home. Sanadazian swore that he never saw any blood. Special Agent Miller asked if Sanadazian had questioned McAuley about what had happened. His response was something to the effect that he didn't have to ask his father-in-law, that he knew something really bad had occurred there in the house and that they were, in fact, cleaning up a mess. They used an industrial vacuum cleaner to clean the entire area. Then McAuley asked Sanadazian to help him haul the debris to the local dump. Sanadazian told investigators that he and McAuley discarded sheetrock carpeting and even the vacuum cleaner in the Martin County landfill. His statement corroborated Bill Anderson's story. Anderson told us that McAuley had told him that he had killed Frank Black in the entry to his house. And now we had Sanadazian telling us that immediately after 
Frank Black's disappearance, he was summoned to that house to do a remodeling job or a, a makeover of the foyer area right where Anderson states Mackerley said he shot Frank Black. In the middle of August, an evidence recovery team arrived at the landfill. Based on records, investigators were able to determine where the items were likely dumped six months earlier on February 26th. The recovery team searched for anything that could be traced back to Mackerley's home. For three hot days, investigators scoured a specific area of the landfill. The landfill uh, management was able to determine by the date exactly where it was. And it was in a spot that was actually feasible and possible that we'd find it. So uh, we did that. We got the equipment uh, with the sheriff's office, crime scene, and so forth. And we dug it up. And we found carpeting that we believed was from Mackley's residence. Investigators found portions of sheetrock and a vacuum cleaner that matched the description Sanitation had given. They brought the items to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Forensics Laboratory for analysis. Despite their strong suspicions, lab analysts were unable to conclusively match any of the items to Mackerley's house. Technicians also processed Mackerley's foyer and retrieved traces of what appeared to be blood. Unfortunately, DNA markers found in the samples could not be exclusively matched to Frank Black's DNA. It was another dead end. Investigators still had no physical evidence. Agents pressed on, continuing to build a strong circumstantial case for state prosecutor Belange by further corroborating Sanadazian's story about the cleanup. The FBI went to Walmarts and Kmarts and got receipts where Alan Mackerley was buying bleach and Comet and cleaning supplies and trash bags and duct tape and all the tools and implements he needed to clean up a crime scene. Just before trial, investigators received disturbing news. Martin County jail inmates claimed that Mackerley had hired someone to kill Bill Anderson. Mackerley knew that if he could prevent Anderson from testifying, prosecutors would have to drop their case. Early in 1997, murder suspect Alan McAley was held without bond for the murder of Frank Black. While he was behind bars, investigators learned he had ordered the murder of witness Bill Anderson. As of that point, uh, the security for Bill Anderson tremendously increased and we began making arrangements uh, to have Bill uh, and his wife go into the uh, Federal Witness Protection Program. Mackerley's would-be hitman would not be a reliable witness in court, so attempted murder for hire charges against Mackerley were dropped. Alan Mackerley's trial began on January 20th, 1998. Mr. Even Anderson, without the victim's body, Florida State Mackerley Prosecutor Mackerley Robert Belanger was confident in the case. There's case law going back to old England where murders have been prosecuted uh, without a body successfully, uh, and the courts have said that we don't reward people because they successfully disposed of the body. You can still prove death through circumstantial evidence like any other fact in the case by a person's habits and routines, uh, by the fact that they didn't pack for a long trip, um, by declarations of intent, I'm going to go to Florida. Uh, all these things uh, combined demonstrated pretty conclusively that Frank Black was dead. Nevertheless, that is a, a source of frustration. Mr. Mackerley told me the that prosecution's the main witness, Bill Anderson, Black recalled what he knew about Frank Black's murder. Prosecutors filled in the gaps and detailed the events of February 24, 1996, the last day Black was seen alive. Mackerley's lover, Lisa Costello, picked up Frank Black at the West Palm Beach Airport that evening.
she took him to Mackerley's house on the pretense of meeting other business partners. Black was unaware that he had just stepped into the home of his bitter rival. While Costello and Black discussed the lucrative business deal, prosecutors believe Costello dropped a capsule of Rufinol into his drink. Black would not have noticed. The powerful sedative is odorless, colorless, and tasteless. The two talked while Costello waited for the drug to take effect. As planned, McAuley took over at that point. He had Costello remove Black's wallet. Hey, why don't you go get change? Later, they would use his credit cards to create a false trail for police. Black was powerless due to the heavy sedative. Get up. Finally in control of his rival, McAuley's hatred boiled over. In the foyer, he put a gun to Black's head. McAuley had to get rid of the evidence. He wrapped the body and murder weapon in plastic. Using one of his power boats, he would later dump the body about 16 miles offshore. Took the body out about 20 miles. Anderson testified that McAuley said he had to stab through the plastic and Black's body several times to get it to sink. He then returned home to finish cleaning up. He tore out anything that had been stained by blood or human tissue. Using bleach, they scrubbed the entire area clean. Anderson's testimony was bolstered by powerful circumstantial evidence. Phone calls linking McAuley and Black Robert Sanadajian's story of the cleanup and covert recordings from Anderson's house. Thunder will rise. How do you find the defendant? It was enough to convince the jury. On February 4th, 1998, they found Alan McAuley guilty of kidnapping and murder. After McAuley's trial, prosecutors turned to Lisa Costello. When I looked, I saw the dead body of Faced with murder charges, she finally gave a full statement as to the events that led to Frank Black's death. Ultimately, she entered a plea to third-degree murder and false imprisonment, which are lesser-included offenses. She was sentenced to 10 years in the Florida State Prison An appeals court overturned McAuley's kidnapping conviction, finding that Frank Black traveled to Florida on his own volition. But the murder conviction stood. Alan McAuley was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Although Frank Black's body has not yet been recovered, his killer, Alan McAuley, will never go free.